In the summer of 2003, I began filming the series Atheism, A Rough History of Disbelief. As part of the process, I talked to a number of writers, scientists, historians, and philosophers. Having secured their cooperation, I was very embarrassed to find that a large proportion of what went on ended up on the cutting room floor, simply because the series would have lasted 24 hours otherwise. Well, as it happens, the BBC agreed with me that the conversations were too interesting to be junked. And with these six supplementary programmes, they've made the extremely unusual decision to go back to the original material and to broadcast at length some of the conversations which I had. Conversations with people such as the English biologist Richard Dawkins, the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, the Cambridge theologian Dennis Turner, the American playwright Arthur Miller, the English philosopher Colin McGinn, and the American Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. Now, the Nobel Prize winning American physicist Steven Weinberg has often addressed himself to what he sees as the pernicious effects of religion. And when I met him in Texas, I started by asking him how he reacted to the fact that the physicists, who were his own intellectual predecessors, had seen the physical regularity of the universe and the beauty of the Earth to be incontrovertible evidence of divine design. Looking at nature uh, in the past, the impression of design must have been overwhelming. I mean, it's such a comfortable, pleasant earth, and things work out so well. Uh, well, as we learn more and more about the universe, it seems uh, not such a friendly place, and we appear just to have been winners in a cosmic lottery. And yet there might be those um, believers who might say, yes, admittedly, there are other uh, celestial bodies which are not good stage sets for life, let alone for the human drama. But here we are on Earth, which is, as they would say, convivially arranged to, uh, to accommodate Well, life. What, what would you expect? I mean, with all these billions and billions of planets, some of them are going to be comfortable. And it's only on those that life can arise. But um, people like Newton, for example, and uh, Samuel Clarke, who wrote, as it were, on his behalf later on in, at Trinity when he did the Boyle Lectures, um, was not invoking the, the comfort and, con and conviviality of the Earth. Uh, Newton was impressed by the regularity of nature. Whether or not it was a suitable setting for the human drama, he thought that the laws of motion and the arrangement of the... Uh, of the, of the celestial system um, expressed design regardless of its suitability for human existence. Yes, and, uh, well, he was religious. Mm. He saw the universe as a great puzzle, just as he saw the book of Daniel as a great puzzle. And it was God leaving messages for human beings to puzzle out. And he puzzled out the way the solar system worked, and he tried to puzzle out the chronology of the Bible. Uh, well, we don't do that anymore. But might there be any reason, and in fact you still find people, and indeed some of your own colleagues, um, who feel that nevertheless the regularity, um, by definition, involves and invokes uh, a regulator? Well, it... It doesn't, there is a mystery, I have to admit. Uh, you know, we try to understand nature and we ask questions and we get answers and then we ask more follow-up questions. Well, why is that true? And uh, we ultimately we hope to come to some set of elegant physical principles that describe everything. And when we have it, the mystery will still be there because we'll always have to ask, why is it that theory and not some other theory? And one answer is, well, that is the regularity imposed on it by a spirit, a designer. But it, that doesn't answer anything. I mean, then you have to say, well, why is the designer like that? You know, either by a designer you have something in particular in mind, um, a god who is 
benevolent or jealous or humorous, mm. <laughs> whatever, or you have nothing in mind. If you have nothing in mind, let's not talk about it. And if you have something in mind, then the question arises, well, why is, is that true? So I don't see that having a designer puts us at rest. I think we're permanently in the tragic position of being able, not, of not being able to understand at the deepest possible level why things are the way they are. And um, we'll just have to live with that. But saying, well, it's a designer doesn't, doesn't settle it, doesn't help. But let's say, and I'm being, as it were, the deist's advocate here, uh, or... Uh, instead of the devil's instead advocate. Instead of the devil's advocate. Um, let's say that it doesn't exhibit, or it doesn't answer the question of design, but if there is this um, insuperable mystery, um, might one understand how it is that people feel that in the presence of such a mystery, that... Uh, they, as it were, it's the thin end of, of some sort of theological wedge into which spirituality or an originator can be inserted. Oh, I, I mean, I don't feel that. I, I, I don't feel that way either. I suppose many do. I think much more likely is that people are religious because they're, they know they're going to die and they know their loved ones are going to die. And that's the tragedy. It's not that that bothers them. It's not the tragedy of not being able to come to the final cause. It's the tragedy of knowing that your life and all the wonderful things that you can do and living and the people you love, that that's all going to end. Uh, it seems to me that provides the driving force for religion much more than these philosophical wonderings about first cause. These issues of the beginning of time were discussed very intelligently long ago by Augustine, and uh, who grappled with the question of what there was before time began. And uh, he said, God created the world with time, that uh, time was created. There was no before, that that's part of the creation. Um, that's as good an answer as any, I guess. But it is interesting that someone like Augustine, without the benefits of, of, of quantum physics, without the benefits of Einstein, without the benefits of any of your sort of work, was able to invoke ideas such as time itself having a beginning. Yes. Well, Augustine was a very clever man, and uh, it's wonderful, looking back over all the thousands of years of speculation about these things, that time, I think first with Galileo, became part of the ordinary um, ambit of science. I mean, Galileo was the first person who tried to measure time uh, during a physical process, measured the time it took for various balls to roll down an inclined plane, and he got the rule that the distance traveled is proportional to the square of the time. Nobody before had ever tried to bring time into the laws of nature quantitatively. Uh, but for Galileo, observing these regularities and observing the, uh, the, the relationship between uh, these balls rolling down slopes, the time it took, mm. and giving a mathematical expression for that, for him, uh, as an unquestioningly religious man, they were, in fact, demonstrations of God's mind. Well, I don't think Galileo came to that conclusion. I'm not, if he did, I'm not aware of it. But the, if what you're suggesting is that uh, there is no necessary conflict between being a scientist and being religious, I, I suppose I have to agree. There, even now, there are very fine scientists who are deeply religious. I know a few. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I think what happened, and it only began to happen with Galileo and Newton, so it took a long time to mature. What happened was that much of the early uh, basis for religious belief was dissolved by science. It wasn't that scientific discoveries made religion impossible. It, it's that they made irreligion possible. Mm. It became possible to understand how things worked 
without the religious explanation. And particularly, uh, I think more important than anything any physicist did was what Darwin did, Darwin and Wallace. Yes, well, this is the, uh, the argument which we've had, I think, I think from Dennett, from Daniel Dennett. He feels that perhaps the most wounding uh, influence upon religion really came with Darwin rather than with Galileo. Oh, and, I agree, and, uh, I agree. Uh, even though it hurts my pride as a physicist to say so, uh, you know, because people don't really care that much about the way the planets go around the sun or, uh, or the way, the, certainly they don't care about the balls rolling down the inclined plane. What they care about is life and particularly their own life and their relationship to uh, the causes for them being the way they are. They care about that. Um, and Darwin's revision of the, uh, argue, of the understanding of why living things are the way they are, in particular why people are the way they are, was overwhelming. And Darwin himself lost his faith. Uh, you know, I, I was recently rereading uh, Lytton Strachey's wonderful little biography of Cardinal Manning mm. in Eminent Victorians. And Manning said that he was, con he became convinced, a, a convinced Christian because of reading uh, Paley's Natural Theology. Yeah. Yes, and, and the wonderful uh, adaptation of living things uh, convinced him that there had to be a creator a person, a personality that created all this. And suddenly that was gone. There wasn't a discovery that there wasn't a creator, but the, the argument was removed. And I don't think anything in, that science has done for general culture has ever been as important as that. Yes, it is interesting to find that on the whole, the, the percentage of biological disbelievers in the scientific community is higher than the percentage of disbelievers amongst your colleagues in physics well, and chemistry. Is that true? I didn't know that. Uh, actually, I've occasionally, not too often, gotten into conversations with my physicist colleagues about religion. I find an overwhelming lack of interest in it. I, I once said that they don't care enough about it to qualify as practicing atheists. They um, they just regard it as a sort of question that it's silly to raise. And um, I, I, for some obscure reason, I, I tend to care about it. Uh, and I'm interested in religion. But uh, most of my physicist friends are not. Um, but you find such a variety of beliefs. I, I have one f friend, a very distinguished astrophysicist, who told, told me that he's an orthodox, observant Jew which is a lot of trouble, you know, that's not easy, and doesn't believe in God. Um, because for him, the religion is a um, framework for life that he inherited from his parents. He grew up with it. He wants to stay in it. Um, but he doesn't think there's anything behind it. Uh, I, I think probably a fair number of people in the Church of England feel that way. I think for a number of people, the retreat into religion is, as you say, um, not a retreat into belief, but a retreat into reassuring domestic ritual. And I suspect that that's much greater for Jews than it is for Christians. I mean, there is a, a way in which one could say that belief is less important for Jews than observance. I think that's very true. Uh, one could argue about the reasons for it, but. I don't think Judaism is the only religion for which that's true. I think it's also true for Hinduism. Um, I don't think the Hindus have ever looked very closely into what they all believe. They, they're allowed to believe in all sorts of things. But the important thing is, you know, the Brahmins are not supposed to cross the, the ocean and uh, you're not supposed to kill cows. Those are, that's what's important. What, you know, what you really think about Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva, I don't think you, there was ever an inquisition in, uh, in, among the Hindus. On the other hand, then you have religions like Christianity, Islam, and I guess to some extent Buddhism. 
Uh, these are the religions that have missionaries that go out and try to convert other people. And it's in these religions that have universalist ambitions that um, theology becomes important. And it, is, it does become important. And uh, in a way, I'm more attracted to that <laughs> because as a uh, scientist, I care about searching for truth and making a theory of the world. And uh, Christianity, uh, or Buddhism for that matter, uh, provides an alternative theory of the world. And uh, that's something I have I feel I have something to say about, I can interact with, I can respond to. On the other hand, if people just want to not eat pork or not kill cows or whatever it is, well, you know, more power to them. It has nothing to do with me and it, it, it's, there's, no, uh, uh, there's no argument there. So you feel a, a, a realistic and vigorous sense of opposition yeah. in that they are, that Christianity and Buddhism, in a diff rather different way, are in fact, uh, as it were, more intellectually intelligible and uh, complementary to a scientific worldview. Yes, yes. They have a theory, and it's a theory that I don't agree with, but there is a theory there. Uh, and without a theory, what can I say? <laughs> you know, then, then it's not something that I can engage. Um, I, I once wrote something rather disparaging uh, about ultra-liberal Christian, Christianity, and that I found myself more, uh, in some ways, more akin to a fundamentalist because at least they haven't forgotten what it is to believe something. Uh, and I got a copy of a fundamentalist newspaper from, I think, from New Mexico that praised me. <laughs> because what they really, I think what their real concern was was not the odd atheist physicist. That wasn't what they're worried about. What they're worried about are the liberal Christians. Oh, I see. So that, in fact, that the... Uh, the, the, the fundamentalist Christians see you scientists as worthy opponents. Well, in the same way that you scientists I don't, or I don't you physicists they, are no, seeing. I, think, I don't. I, I wouldn't draw that implication. Mm. I think they just found a surprising ally in the battle that they really care about. Their battle with the liberal wing of of, of Christianity. But uh, please don't let me give the f wrong impression. I think the harm. I think enormous harm is done. Uh, in, by religion, not just in the name of religion, but actually by religion. And um, uh, I think how, it's... How, how is it? Uh, uh, tell me the harm that is done by religion as opposed to the harm that's done in the name of it. Well, I think uh, people who crash airplanes into office buildings in order to destroy them uh, must really believe in paradise and that this is something that their God wants them to do and that they'll be rewarded in paradise. And if they don't believe that, then it's a very foolish career move. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but, it, you know, the idea that God has, whether it's Allah or Jehovah or whatever, has dictated uh, certain ways of behaving, certain ways of worshiping, and that it's incumbent on you to force others to be behave that way and to worship in that way. God, think of all the harm that's been done throughout all the ages uh, by people who believe that and believe it very sincerely. One can j just go on and on and on about the number of very sincerely religious people who were led by their religion to do the most awful things. But in fact, that was very much an aspect of Judaism before oh, the diaspora. Oh, absolutely, yes. And I, I couldn't, I do agree. But just coming back to what we were talking about before, it is the religions that have a theory of the world, it seems to me, at least in recent centuries, that do the harm. So the, uh, the very sincere, true believers are the ones you have to watch out for, even though they may have something more to show for themselves intellectually than the more liberal mm. religious. 
but they're the dangerous ones. Well, given the fact that the current president of the United States could be described as a sincere, true believer, I wanted to know whether Stephen himself was alarmed by the apparent growth of fundamentalist Christianity in his own country. I don't see the United States in the grips of a, uh, a really disturbing uh, religious uh, awakening. Uh, I think what's much more frightening in the world is Islam, where uh, people, it seems to me, take their religion seriously to the point of madness. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, there have been times in the history of the world when Islam was a far more tolerant religion than Christianity, but that, that is not the case now. But there is undoubtedly, for uh, certainly for a European, the impression that there's a very strong association between Christianity and patriotism in a way that simply doesn't exist in Europe, certainly not in my own country, in the United Kingdom. Yes, uh, well, it's... I know that it, that impression exists, and I think Americans think more highly of religion than Europeans do. I sometimes think that Americans believe in religion much more than Europeans do. They don't believe in God much more than Europeans do. <laughs> but they believe that religion is good for you. Oh, yes. And um, without being particularly religious in any meaningful way. You know, I know many people who go, say they're religious and go to church every Sunday and uh, belong to church organizations. And then when you talk to them and you ask them, well, do you really, you know, do you really think after death this is going to happen? They say, I have no idea. I don't know. It's all a mystery, but as I think it's good to be religious. This is the faith I grew up with. As a physicist, you have to decide what you think is true, and you get in the habit of that kind of intellectual activity. And because if you work on the wrong theory and it isn't true, you wasted your professional time, and uh, you keep having to make judgments of truth or falsity, and so truth becomes uh, very important to you. Uh, for most people, truth is not as important as um, good behavior or loyalty to your ethnic group or loyalty to your family traditions. And uh, you know, truth is something that you don't worry about very much. Although, of course, that in, the, uh, in the Middle Ages, and indeed, when people were opposing atheism in the 17th century, it was insisted that the truthfulness of religion was what guaranteed good behavior. Yes, and many people believe that. But an awful lot of people also believe it doesn't matter whether it's true. You have to be religious because that will guarantee good behavior. You know, the wonderful line of Gibbons um, about the pagan religions, he said, the, uh, in the multitude of gods, uh, Gibbon said, uh, the common people found them all equally true, and the philosophers found them all equally false, and the magistrates found them all equally useful. Oh, yes. And I think many people uh, in America, and undoubtedly in Europe, uh, are in the position of the magistrates that Gibbon was talking about. They find them useful. Um, although I don't, I, I really don't think that uh, I don't see religion as actually uh, inspiring moral behavior. In fact, you very often hear people say, well, these people who uh, blow themselves up uh, for some religious reason in the Middle East or Hindu mobs who destroy a mosque or Muslim mobs who kill Hindus, or, uh, that they're not really religious that real religion doesn't involve that kind of behavior. I think what they're saying is that they have a moral sense which allows them to distinguish what is religious from what is not religious. I think, for example, uh, George Bush said that uh, these terrorists have hijacked a great religion so, because their actions, their terrorist actions, don't fit his idea of religion. You see, what's really happening there is that instead of using religion to decide what is moral, mm. they're using their moral sense, which fortunately is a perfectly good, reasonable, enlightened moral sense, to decide what is religious. 
And uh, if that's the case, then what's the point of the religion? Finally, I wanted to know whether there were any particular reasons, apart from being constantly asked by people like myself, why Stephen felt it necessary to address himself to the topic of religion more than many of his colleagues did. Oh, I try not to do it too much. You know, I don't want to become the village atheist. Uh, and I do get involved in a lot of other issues like missile defense and uh, uh, neo, well, post-constructionism, neo-modernism. But um, I do spend probably a little bit more time than I should on on religion and uh, I have a certain amount of hostility to uh, to it. Uh, I think the most rational reason for it is because of the harm that I see it does. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, many people do simply awful things out of sincere religious belief, not using religion as a cover uh, the way Saddam Hussein may have done, but really because they believe that this is what God wants them to do. Going all the way back to Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac because God told him to do that. Putting God ahead of humanity is a terrible thing. Yeah. Um, another reason is because I'm offended by the kind of smarmy religiosity that's all around us. Perhaps more in America than in, than in Europe. It, and not really that harmful, because not really that intense or even that serious. But just, you know, after a while, you get tired of hearing clergymen in giving the invocation at various public celebrations, and you feel, haven't we outgrown all this? Do we have to listen to this? Yeah. Uh, but then, maybe at the very bottom of it, I really don't like God. You know, I mean, it's silly to say I don't like God because I don't believe in God, but mm. in the same sense that I don't like Iago or I don't like the Reverend Slope or, or any of the other villains of literature, the God of traditional Judaism and Christianity and Islam seems to me a terrible character. He's a God who will, who's obsessed with the degree to which people worship him and anxious to punish with the most awful torments those who don't worship him in the right way. Now, I realize that many people don't believe in that anymore who call themselves Muslims or Jews or Christians, but that is the traditional mm. God. And he's a terrible character. I don't like him. Um, I have a friend, or had a friend, now dead, Abdus Salam, a very devout Muslim who was trying to bring science into the universities in the Gulf states. And he, he told me that he had a terrible time because um, although they were very receptive to technology, they felt that science would be a corrosive to religious belief. And they were worried about it. And damn it, I think they were right. It is corrosive of religious belief. And it's a good thing, too. That's terrific. <laughs>